Hey everyone, welcome back to the Hardware News Recap of the Week. We have a good episode for you this week. So we're going to be talking about some MSI malware concerns. The company issued a statement warning people not to download drivers from suspicious locations. And the reason is that MSI was recently breached and the source code was leaked as part of that breach. So feasibly hackers could now create malicious versions of MSI software and drivers uh, and convince people to download. Additionally, we'll be going over the budget boards for AM5. So this is going to be the new A620 series of chipsets. Uh, it's supposed to be the cheapest possible AM5 boards that'll be out there. And further, there's some news on a potential 10% uplift, 10 to 12% for the 7800X3D through a simple BIOS tweak. Let's get started. Before that, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. We use Squarespace for our own GN store and juggle complex multi-piece orders all the time with it. Squarespace makes it fast for us to roll out new products with detailed pages full of galleries, videos, and descriptors. It's also useful for your own resume sites, for photographer or project portfolios, or for starting your new small business idea. There's never been a better time to try and start your new business than right now. And we can vouch that Squarespace makes it easy. Visit squarespace.com slash gamersnexus to get 10% off your first purchase with Squarespace. So first up, quick GN store update. We have a new project in soldering, Matt. We always like to do a quick news segment on the news video that follows the launch of one of our products because uh, these are exciting. We spent a lot of time working on them and we're really happy with the way our custom stuff comes out. So wanted to go over it quickly. First of all, a huge thank you because it was a massive success thus far. We still have more in stock if you want to grab one on store.gamersnexus.net. But for everyone who has purchased one so far, thank you sincerely because we've been working on this for two years now. It was a lot of back and forth of changing the supply, so thickening the silicone, going with higher quality materials, tweaking and fine tuning the placement of the specific spots on the mat where you can place and organize screws and tools and all that stuff. And then we just started working on sort of an FAQ because we got some of the early questions in. People were asking a lot about how resilient is it against paint, glue, uh, cutting, and heat, which is extremely heat resistant, but we're working on a more specific number for you. And I have some early results. We're gonna do a separate thing on this. It'll be on GN Extra as then an FAQ for the support team to answer. But just so you know, so I asked Patrick, who has some uh, miniatures and model building experience, I asked him to do some testing and he created, and this is awesome, this grid uh, of the different paints, adhesives, and chemicals and uh, when I explained the test to her, I said, I want you to treat it kind of like, I said, have you ever had an allergy test? You know, where they do the grid of shots and they're all like an inch apart. So we did that on the mat. We did an allergy test for how it reacts to different things. Uh, and we had already tested a lot of stuff, but we had specific questions from people that we hadn't considered. So like, how does it do with Citadel paint, for example, if you play Warhammer or do any wargaming uh, with miniatures? And we have some initial results. So first of all, on the paints, just briefly, it held up really well to everything that we tested. So we tested uh, Tamaya and Citadel primarily, and soap and warm water was able to get rid of all of it. This actually is the unit that we tested. And I held it up a second ago, it was pretty clean. So soap and warm water with a washcloth or a rag gets rid of pretty much all the paints. You don't really, you know, you want to minimize how long it sits there dried, but we did allow it to fully dry and it wiped off. As for glues and specific heat and all that stuff, uh, we're compiling the full report. Patrick's writing it up for me. And we'll post that on the site, on the store page, if you want to learn more about it. Or you can email the support team and they'll have an answer soon. But anyway, I wanted to share it because this stuff is really exciting where it's just, it's fun. And this is what we do for our jobs normally, but we get to test it and, and apply the same methodology to our own product. So that's always cool. And as for what exactly this is, if you don't know, it's on store.gamersaccess.net. These are our new project and soldering mats. We made these out of a super dense, thick, heavy, and high quality silicone material. And it makes the mat a very hefty project surface that can withstand extreme heat and also serve as a workstation to store all of your tools. It has molded in driver flux brush and spool holders and small parts trays and screw organizers. And we also molded in some electrical gates and diagrams for electronic students or enthusiasts. Now these are different from the mod mats. So they're both durable surfaces, but they're built for different things. The mod mats provide a specific and purpose-built anti-static conductive surface for ESD sensitive projects. We have a whole video 
explaining the ESD properties, how different anti-static materials and surfaces work. And it includes a common ground point ESD wrist straps. They're also much larger to accommodate PC building. They have diagrams for PC builds and silhouettes for parts. And they're moderately heat resistant for like heat guns and some light soldering. The project and solder mats though are an insulative, extremely heat resistant silicone. So it can withstand solder and iron contact directly and it's easy to clean. And it's also sort of 3D to sort tools and things like that. So uh, just to give you an idea for the density though, the mod mat that the solder mat's currently on top of, this weighs almost as much as the much larger surface below it uh, because of how heavy duty we went with it. And uh, it's, been, it's been awesome. Uh, We've been using it internally for a while now, and we've had to hide it every time we film something. So I'm happy to finally be able to share it. And anyway, thank you everyone for supporting us on these endeavors. It's always a lot of fun. And uh, we try not to like harass you all too much with the news updates about what we're doing for the store, but it is the best opportunity for us to talk about, hey, here's some of the stuff we're doing that we're really excited and passionate about, in addition to all the reviews that the store helps fund, including the testing and all the research. So, all right, let's get to the news stories. So first up, MSI has posted some explicit warnings for people not to download drivers or software from any website that's not theirs right now. And they've posted this before. Obviously, that's just good advice in general, but as you all know, there are sort of download rehosting sites, and sometimes, for various reasons, those may be where people land. But uh, for this specific instance, MSI noted that it suffered a breach of its servers. It didn't really disclose further detail as to what exactly that means, what servers. Uh, it does appear to be internal servers, not necessarily the website, although who knows how much they separate them. And uh, the company at this point hasn't disclosed too much useful information, but uh, including the lack of specificity. But uh, currently, the implication is that they've lost control of some of their source code, and that would largely be source code that builds drivers. And that's dangerous <laughs> because that, that gives you a pretty good attack vector that looks very authentic. So a post by Bleeping Computer had some additional information. It suggested that a ransomware organization claimed the breach and specifically noted that it has source code. It is uh, asking for money in return of releasing that source code, to, I suppose, back to MSI and the extent that it can do it. So we can also read between some lines here. MSI specifically instructing customers not to download things, suggest that they have sufficient concern, to believe that there could be compromised drivers or software out there. We already know there's a compromised versions of Afterburner out there, which is the MSI overclocking and system monitoring utility. It is actually a good tool, but uh, actually recently, they specifically put out a notice saying, don't download Afterburner from anywhere that's not MSI's website, because uh, I think that particular attack was a crypto-related um, scam or, uh, or mining software in the background. We had a news story on it. It's been a while. But anyway, this is just good advice in general to download things directly from the source. We're going to add our own warning here. Because it's not clear how far this breach has penetrated MSI servers, we would recommend maybe wait a little bit on just downloading anything from them either to allow them some time to fully scrub and scan their own uploaded files and make sure that those haven't been silently swapped with something that could be concerning. Either way, sticking to just MSI's website should isolate attack vectors uh, to just their own first-party compromised servers rather than uh, uncompromised third-party servers hosting compromised files. So maybe wait a little bit just to be sure. Next one, also MSI news, but this is better news for them. MSI posted after the 7800X3D announcement its own announcement about a BIOS update that reportedly, according to them, boosts performance of the 7800X3D somewhere around 10 to 12% for basically a BIOS toggle. So in other words, sort of doing nothing, at least as much as you can do nothing to gain performance. And this one is just following up the X3D launch. We have that review on our channel. You should check it out if you haven't seen it. Really interesting part. And following the launch, MSI's update is reportedly going to be available on all MSI 600 series AMD motherboards and specifically the ones that use the AGISA Combo PI 1.0.0.6 base for the build. There are actually three new enhanced mode boost settings under the PBO menu, suggesting that part of MSI's change lies in manipulating the underlying PBO values. Additionally, MSI has another new feature for memory. It's called a high efficiency mode. It looks like these are actually preset memory timing configurations available in four steps from relaxed 
to tightest. Now, in the past, we've heard from overclockers that secondary timings actually matter a lot on DDR5, relatively speaking, and that not all motherboards set them appropriately. So this could help there. MSI claims that combining the two can boost game performance by up to 12%. MSI also showed off some benchmarks from ADA64 as an indication that memory sensitive production tasks may benefit from these tweaks as well. So in essence, this is being billed as a sort of free 10% or so boost. It's 10 to 12, they say. Uh, with no real downsides, according to MSI. The only theoretical downside might be stability. So maybe there's some heat there, depending on how they're playing with the PBO values. But uh, stability would, um, would show itself pretty quickly. So we might take a look at it. No promises. It's, it seems like pretty straightforward uh, stuff in BIOS. We've tested things like APE in the past. And uh, the results weren't that exciting from a content perspective, but maybe worth considering for a user perspective. EK and Seagate are working on some lightsaber heat sinks and SSDs, and these are officially branded. So we're getting more official collaborations between big brand intellectual property and computer parts. And we don't hate this, because we've gone uh, on, on record a lot talking about Yestin, for example, and how it's been doing really cool sort of self-branded, just different things. And they don't always work out great, but it's awesome to see stuff like the cute pet cards and like the Sakura card where they're doing something just different. And that's what EK and Seagate are doing here. They're doing it more of the traditional approach though, where clearly someone said, how do we get a lot of sales without inventing our own thing? Let's license someone else's. And that's what they're doing. Definitely a very sort of old school approach to making something unique, but the companies are offering two variations. They have one light side and one dark side set of SSDs with tributes to Obi-Wan Kenobi, Luke Skywalker, and Darth Vader. There's an LED light bar under the heatsink cover that shoots down to the saber hilt, so you'd want to install this in the most visible M.2 slot you can find. There are also a lot of cool build options with this theme if you can find a board that best showcases it. As for hard specs, Seagate and EK note that these are Fire CUDA drives, that's part of Seagate's branding, and their PCIe Gen 4 NVMe SSD is up to two terabytes in capacity and operating sequentially up to 7,300 megabytes per second. EK's primary contribution here was a specific loading mechanism that attaches the faceplate to the SSD. The companies noted that the faceplates are interchangeable. And these would go well with NVIDIA's Star Wars video cards from a few years ago, if you remember those. It was a uh, special release for, it was around the, the 20 series timing and uh, unfortunately not modern, so you can't do the full themed thing if you want a new video card. But hey, we're happy to see just different stuff visually. It's, it does make it more interesting for everyone. And um, whether or not you know, you're into Star Wars specifically, it's, it's cool to see something new. So budget, A620 boards for AM5. This is important news because we're finally getting into territory where AM5 boards are getting affordable. Uh, AMD motherboards for AM5 and the A620 chipset are official now. It is no longer a rumor. And at this point, they are planning to offer just the lowest possible cost alternative to X670 and B650. Uh, there is reduced connectivity, of course. There's no CPU overclocking support. So this is the one where they've specifically turned that off. Uh, and at the time of writing, there are only two ASRock boards that are available on Newegg for public retail. And the cheaper of the two is $86. Big change. So now, to be fair, the original A-series boards, and it's been a long time, and say 2017, 18, whenever it was, you could get those for like 40, 50 bucks sometimes <laughs> new. So it's still more, but uh, it is much cheaper than what we've seen for AM5. And this one is the A620M HDV M.2. And, uh, and this one, we'll, we'll give it a closer look. So at a third of the price of the cheapest X670 board, for starters, A620 doesn't have any PCIe 5.0 at all on any board, or at least it shouldn't by the spec. And here, that's evidenced by the first M.2 slot below the socket having ASRock's Hyper M.2 branding, which corresponds to Gen 4. There's another M.2 slot way down in the bottom right corner, but it has no markings to indicate what generation it is, and an M.2 Wi-Fi slot is located along the left. The standard PCIe slot layout isn't really anything special here. It's mildly surprising, though, that ASRock put two additional X1 slots below the main metal-clad X16. Maybe they had leftover inventory from mining boards. For memory, it's DDR5. Ryzen 7000 cannot do DDR4, and it has just two slots. 
Considering the capacities available these days from two sticks, that's adequate for a low-end system. And honestly, it'd be nice to see more boards embrace the two-dim configuration because it can help with memory stability, but here, that's not the goal. It's cheap is the goal. One thing we're potentially concerned about is the VRM layout. We'd have to test it, and we probably won't, to be fair. Uh, but with only a 4 plus 1 plus 1 phase layout using 50 amp stages, the lack of a heat sink here could be a problem on some of the CPUs AMD is offering. It depends what you socket in there and what your case airflow configuration is. There's a set of holes on the left VRM area that look like they could be for a heatsink, but we'd guess ASRock didn't think it was worth it. Paradoxically, it's usually the boards that need them most that get snubbed. And while the 16 phase plus monsters that don't necessarily need them get wildly overkill thermal designs because it looks cool. But maybe that's part of our motherboard unhinged rant part two. The back of the board is featureless, it's fine. It shows the unusually forward position of the CPU socket though due to the board's reduced width. What's left of the rear IO after extreme cost cutting has only five USB ports counting the type C and it would probably be a good idea to pick up a USB hub to go along with this if you have uh, a lot of peripherals. But there is a reason for minimum viable products to exist. For example, low-end PCs that are used primarily in maybe just like a, a household PC for the family or an office PC where it just kind of does web browsing. So uh, if you get good enough airflow there uh, over the VRM, it could be an okay low-cost choice for low-end Ryzen 7000 parts but you are giving up a lot here. It's just, you know, don't, don't put a high-end part in this. It would be a w massive waste. The 100 plus dollar version of the board has a few more features here and there. So a couple of them would be six VRM phases and a heat sink. And that board or one of the other options like the Asus Tough Gaming might be more appealing to value focused buyers than say the absolute cheapest thing, depending on, again, what you're using, where they're priced. Up next is the Asus Ally. Asus ROG pulled an April Fool's prank and then reversed it and said, it's not actually a joke. Haha, -ha, we got you. Now you don't know if the product is real. Not sure that's a great joke, but okay. Uh, Razer did it with the toaster. They did it the other way though. They, they made a Razer toaster as a prank. And then at some point, the CEO said he would actually make it if they hit some goal or enough people cared. Uh, they hit the goal and I don't think they've made it yet. So there's two ways to do things here. Uh, either way, Asus is proceeding to sow confusion ahead of its launch. The ROG Ally is interesting. It's a new handheld device and it is following clearly the trend that's been set by the Steam Deck, which was wildly successful, especially at its launch. Uh, it's a computer directly aimed at Valve Steam Deck and because Valve benefits from anyone selling any kind of gaming device, they're probably not too upset about it. If anything, it brings more interest surrounding the platform. So it looks like Asus's angle here to do something different is focusing on premium and high end. They are going with a higher end set of specs and core components. They've massively changed how the body looks from say the Steam Deck where Asus is, uses uh, an all white body design newer hardware inside and from what it looks like the texturing on the body of the ROG Ally resembles sort of the Stadia controller texturing. There's not much officially on Asus's website for this but there were two previews that we saw. One was Dave 2D's and one was from LTT and in these previews we got a first look at it. You should check out their videos if you want to learn more and see the hands-on but we'll give you the recap here of the core uh, components and notes. And honestly, their content, both of them, was is the only reason we even heard about this thing. We would have just rolled our eyes at an April Fool's joke otherwise and moved on. But the pre-production units that they featured are technically subject to change. Asus is probably pretty close to being done, though. The exterior white shell is one obvious difference, but the next one is the lack of touchpads. That's a feature that we like on the Steam Deck. It makes navigation easier in desktop mode. So for input, that leaves the Ally with two RGB thumbsticks, a D-pad, four face buttons, shoulder triggers, and two rear buttons. Overall, the Ally has fewer input options than the deck. The rear of the unit shows the intake area for the dual internal fans, which look like they could potentially be restrictive to airflow, more so than the deck, but it really depends on the static pressure of the fan they're using. That brings us to internals. With the rear panel off, we can see how the fans move air through some very small looking fin stacks and out the top of the chassis. And again, the design shown here could change prior to launch, but one of the things we've noticed is that the deck has a larger mesh vent 
and that one was actually pretty low impedance to cool in when we did our in-depth thermal testing. The battery looks pretty big for the Ally. It takes up most of the bottom. This is a Zen 4 APU. It will have RDNA 3 graphics internally. And of course, Asus goes on to say it's the fastest APU yet. But until we actually know which unit it is and what the specs are, uh, that doesn't mean anything. So at this point, it's, it's more, almost guaranteed to be faster, sort of, so to speak, than the Steam Deck and, and more powerful in that regard. To the left of the APU, we noticed that uh, there's an M.2 slot for 30 mil SSDs. Below that are four RAM packages. They're soldered to the board. And this shows us that it's more aligned with the console's unified memory architecture than, say, what you would deal with on a PC uh, where you have separate VRAM and DRAM. Now, the spec bump over the deck continues because the Ally also gets a 7-inch display. It is 1080p. It's capable of 120 hertz refresh rate. And that's up from the deck's 1280 by 800 resolution, which is a 16 by 10 aspect ratio, and it's 60 hertz refresh rate. And then on the top, there's a semi-proprietary connector for the Ally that would allow it to connect to an eGPU mount. So if you wanted to shove a $2,000, 4090 into a thermally constrained box and hook it up by cable to the Ally to use with your Zen 4 APU, then you can do that. Anyway, the price will not be uh, as cheap as maybe people are hoping, but we don't know what it's going to be. We'll find out. Right now, there's only a Best Buy page link with no price listed where you can sign up for notifications. And uh, additionally, Asus here, it, they're going to be forced to run Windows 11 on this because the Steam Deck OS from Valve isn't going to work here just yet. It's a better mobile device than Windows 10, Windows 11 that is, but uh, there's going to be some typical Microsoft bloat, some overhead that might bog it down a little bit, and navigation on Valve's custom Linux OS is actually extremely good. So it's good that there's some differences here because it's not just hardware. There's going to be some competition in terms of software too. And Valve hasn't officially released SteamOS 3 as a generic installer yet, but probably a community-developed port will soon follow the Ally's launch. Now, we're planning on getting our hands on one as soon as we can to go through a similar set of tests as we did for the Steam Deck, including in-depth thermals with thermocouples physically mounted all over the board. Uh, but, you know, we'll talk about that once we have one. Next one, Internet Archive losing a major lawsuit. So Internet Archive is the creator of the Wayback Machine. You've likely used it at some point. And it's a tool that lets you see old versions of websites. It has been under fire for a couple of years now from four major publishing houses, uh, book publishers that is, and these publishers filed a lawsuit over Internet Archive's basically digital library project that they embarked on. Uh, they called it the Controlled Digital Lending Program, and so far the courts appear to be siding with the publishers. So the publishers have identified at least 127 works that they say are illegally hosted and distributed through the Internet Archives program. Now, this started back in 2020 when Internet Archive launched its National Emergency Library Project, which removed all restrictions for lending on a specific set of required reading and educational books. It's just another classic in the American circle of you need to learn to get a good wage, but you need to have a good wage to learn. You want to learn? Give us money. Uh, college textbooks, uh, one of the many, one of the, one of them, they, they got me too. And then I dropped out, so it, anyway. Now, the idea from Internet Archive was because these were required reading for schools, like high schools and colleges, they wanted to provide those resources for students and the public during the pandemic, but received negative attention from some authors and definitely from their publishers. Public libraries also have digital book programs, but the difference with those is that a public library typically buys a license from the publisher or whatever uh, they're buying it from for the number of digital copies that the library will distribute. This is not what Internet Archive is doing, though. In this program, Internet Archive buys a real physical copy of the book. They then digitize it, and they then lend it out online like an unofficial library in this regard. It only lends out one digital copy per physical book it owns uh, without also lending out the physical book, so they retain one of the two copies. Now, Internet Archive argues that this falls within fair use and the first sale doctrine. The first sale doctrine is a part of U.S. copyright law that allows you to resell display or otherwise dispose of a copy of a copyrighted work that you have purchased from the original publisher without the permission to do any of those things from the rights holder because 
you have that specific copy. It's yours to do those things with. So as a simple example, you buy a book, you now possess and own that book, even though you don't own the rights to the material within that book. However, because of the way this works, you are free to lend that book to a friend without legal repercussions. And then that friend is free to never return it to you because they're still reading that book. But your right to distribute the copyrighted work ends when you no longer own that particular copy. So for example, your friend decides to take possession of it. It is now their right to loan it. Internet Archive posits that the way it does things transforms the work enough to leverage fair use for the transformative aspect of it. But the judge for the Southern District of New York disagrees, quote, the crux of IA's first factor argument is that an organization has the right under fair use to make whatever copies of its print books are necessary to facilitate digital lending of that book. And that's so long as only one patron at any time can borrow the book for each copy that has been bought and paid for. But there's no such right which risks eviscerating the rights of authors and publishers to profit from the creation and dissemination of derivatives of their protective work. IA's wholesale copying and unauthorized lending of digital copies of the publisher's print books does not transform the use of the books and IA profits from exploiting the copyrighted material without paying the customary price. This is a firm denial from the court, but despite this, Internet Archive, of course, intends to appeal the decision, and Internet Archive's founder, Brewster Call, made this statement. Quote, libraries are more than the customer service departments for corporate database products. For democracy to thrive at a global scale, libraries must be able to sustain their historic role in society, owning, preserving, and lending books. This ruling is a blow for libraries, readers, and authors, and we plan to appeal it. Now, this one's tough because it's easy to want to side with Internet Archive, which has provided excellent services against four major publishers. It's kind of the classic story of the new fighting the old here. And uh, we could see both sides of it, whereas content creators ourselves, I mean, you know, we don't really think that Internet Archive is necessarily meeting the transformative requirement, but Obviously, no one here is a lawyer, so take that for what it's worth, which is nothing. But it doesn't appear to be a truly transformative work. Um, at the same time, uh, big publishers, especially of textbooks for colleges, are evil, and they do charge way too much money because it's an exploitative practice. So ultimately, all that really matters is what is the legality of it, not what is the morality of it, because that's how the legal system works. And uh, we're not here to answer that. So. Let us know what you think, though. I am genuinely curious how much people uh, side with one or the other, and, and I guess trying to look at it from the um, from the perspective of of maybe of the law, not just the morality. Because uh, Internet Archive is taking the moral ground, which is an okay ground to fight from. Sometimes just depends on who you're fighting, and, and I guess in this case of the publishers, how powerful they are. Up next, a tablet from Asus. The ally wasn't the only crazy thing that they unironically launched or announced on April Fool's Day. Uh, this tablet is the next one. So it comes with a harness, and it is called the ROG Flow Z13-ACRNMN RMT02. They, they need to work on the name. It's the ROG Flow. Apparently, it's a, quote, reality modeling tool. That's cool. I don't know what that means. But it does look like it could be more of a joke than the Ally, except it's real. It's a special edition of the existing Flow Z13 high-performance tablet. It was designed in collaboration with tech fashion brand Acronym. Fun fact, tech fashion exists. And there's a brand called Acronym that does it. The specs include a 13900H and RTX 4070 laptop GPU, but the specs aren't really the focus here. The style is the focus, which means it costs more. The keyboard, for example, has made up characters and not a space bar. No, it actually has a void bar. And actually, it sounds kind of cooler than a space bar. Of course, we would hope that they would also replace backspace with time warp delete and escape with singularity collapse. But they didn't. It's just the, the void bar. The outer shell of the tablet has been replaced with a machined aluminum chassis with shapes, vents, and text all over it. Part of the back shell is a kickstand that spans the entire width of the tablet, allowing it to be stood up in either portrait or landscape mode. And to be fair, it does actually look kind of interesting. At the four corners are huge metal connection points for a large strap that doubles as a harness. Now, there are various buckles and slides on the harness that let you carry it in a number of ways including having it open around waist level so you can use it standing up. And this actually is a thing. 
we've seen used uh, when we were doing construction on the building renovation. I saw one of these in use and uh, they're primarily used in business environments like warehouses, factories, and the model does a good job of looking like a secondary character from the Matrix that probably loses in a fight with an agent in the background of a shot, while also showing off how you're supposed to hold and use this thing. Inside the tablet, Asus boasts of liquid metal and a vapor chamber to provide cooling for high-end mobile silicon inside, and it seems that companies are getting more comfortable with using liquid metal in their thermal designs lately, which is higher risk but higher reward that allows for more effective heat transfer. And if you'd like to have the least cost-effective computer possible, it also includes, like the Ally, one of the uh, semi-proprietary eGPU connectors, so you can buy that and combine it with your tablet. There's no price at the time of writing for the tablet, uh, but it's also going to be high. So that's it for news this week. Thanks for watching, as always, and massive thank you to everyone who bought the project and soldering mats. They're on the store if you want to grab one. If you haven't gotten one yet, you can go over to store.gamersnexus.net. We've got some cool content coming up, including, I can't show the details yet, kind of a retrospective. We'll leave it there. So it's got a lot of cool history and testing in it. All right, thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. See you all next time.